Imagine receiving a gift so bizarre, so unimaginable, that it defies all logic. Now, imagine that gift coming from a god. Welcome to a journey through the tales of mythology where divine offerings go beyond your wildest dreams, or should we say, maybe nightmares. Today, we're uncovering the most bewildering presents ever bestowed by the gods upon mere mortals or other gods. From the heavens above to the depths of the underworld, these gifts have shaped destinies, altered fates, and left humans utterly astounded. Let's dive into it. Pandora's Box The tale begins with the creation of Pandora, the first woman on Earth. According to the myth, after Prometheus stole fire from heaven to give to humans, Zeus decided to counteract this gift by creating Pandora. She was crafted by Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths and craftsmanship, at Zeus's command. Each god contributed something to perfect her. Aphrodite gave her beauty, Hermes gave her persuasion, and Athena clothed her, among other gifts from the gods, making her irresistible to humans. Pandora was given a pithos, a large jar, often mistranslated as a box, upon her marriage to Epimetheus, Prometheus's brother. Zeus instructed her never to open it. However, imbued with curiosity by the gods, Pandora could not resist the temptation and eventually opened the jar. When Pandora opened the jar, all the evils contained within escaped into the world. These included hardship, disease, and various other forms of suffering that had previously been unknown to humanity. The jar thus symbolized a vessel of divine retribution, a tool used by Zeus to exact revenge on humanity for Prometheus's theft of fire. Interestingly, one thing remained in the jar after all the evils flew out, Elpis, the spirit of hope. When Pandora closed the jar, she trapped hope inside, which is often interpreted in two ways as a message that hope is the last thing humans can cling to in times of suffering or that hope is deliberately kept from humanity, making our suffering even more torturous. Pandora's box serves as a symbol of unintended consequences and the dual nature of gifts from the gods. They can contain both blessings and curses. The story also reflects ancient Greek thoughts on the role of women in society with Pandora's creation and actions often interpreted as a reflection of gender dynamics and the notion of women as bringers of both life and destruction. The weirdness of Pandora's box lies in several aspects of the story and the object itself. The box, or jar, appears to be a simple container but holds all the evils of the world inside it. This stark contrast between its unassuming appearance and the catastrophic contents within adds a layer of irony and strangeness. The story centers on Pandora's curiosity, which leads her to open the box despite being warned against it. The god's decision to imbue her with this trait, only to punish her for acting upon it, introduces a strange and ironic twist to the narrative, highlighting the god's capricious nature. Typically, gifts are associated with positive attributes or intentions. However, Pandora's box is a gift from Zeus, that carries a hidden curse. This inversion of the typical nature of gifts adds to its peculiar nature, the release of abstract concepts. When Pandora opens the box, it's not just physical entities that emerge, but abstract concepts like disease, sorrow, and hardship. The idea that such intangible yet profoundly impactful elements of human existence can be contained and released from a physical object is a curious and unsettling notion. The Sibylline Books, Roman Mythology. This story isn't exactly about a gift, but it's about a sale and a very weird one. These books weren't ordinary texts. They contained prophecies and were considered to hold divine insights. The idea that such profound knowledge could be compiled in physical books that could directly influence the fate of a city or empire is itself an unusual concept. The Sibyl of Cumae offered nine books of prophecies to Tarquin the Proud, the last king of Rome, initially at a high price. Her approach to selling these books is peculiar and counterintuitive. Instead of lowering the price after Tarquin the Proud refused to buy them, she burned three and kept the price the same for the remaining. 
This method of reducing the product while maintaining the price is bizarre from a conventional sales perspective, but underscores the book's invaluable nature and the Sybil's non-materialistic stance. The act of burning the books if they were not purchased is an odd and dramatic gesture. It shows a disregard for the material value of the books and emphasizes their spiritual and prophetic significance. The burning could be seen as a symbolic act, representing the loss of wisdom or opportunity that comes with disbelief or hesitation. Once the books were burned, their knowledge was lost forever. This irreversible consequence of Tarquin's hesitation adds a layer of tension and peculiarity to the story. It's a stark illustration of the high stakes involved when dealing with divine or mystical entities. The Sibylline books became a crucial element in Roman religious and political life, consulted in times of crisis to determine the will of the gods and the appropriate actions to take. The transition of these books from a strange offering to a central institutional tool in Rome adds another layer of weirdness, highlighting the fluid boundary between the mystical and the political. The Sibyl's motivations remain mysterious and intriguing. Her willingness to destroy the books rather than lower her price or give them away for free suggests that the transaction was about more than just commerce. It was a test of faith, seriousness, or worthiness, in summary, the weirdness of the Sibylline books as a gift lies in their mystical nature, the bizarre circumstances of their sale, the irreversible consequences of Tarquin's initial refusals, and their profound impact on Roman history. The story intertwines themes of divine wisdom, human skepticism, and the inestimable value of knowledge in a way that is uniquely strange and thought-provoking. The Cup of Jamshid, Persian Mythology this cup, also known as Jammy Jam, is a mythical artifact in Persian mythology that embodies a multitude of extraordinary powers, making it one of the most enigmatic and peculiar gifts in mythological narratives. The cup of Jamshid is named after Jamshid, a legendary king and a prominent figure in Persian mythology, often associated with the Pishdadian dynasty, considered the first dynasty to rule the world. While the exact origin story of the cup varies, it is generally described as a chalice, goblet, or crystal bowl endowed with magical properties. The most celebrated power of the cup of Jamshid is its ability to show its holder the entire universe. It is said that when one looks into the cup, they can see the entire world, with all its cities, mountains, seas, and people, as if they were looking at a map or watching a screen. This aspect symbolizes ultimate knowledge and awareness, making the cup a tool of divine vision and insight. Another extraordinary attribute of the cup is its association with immortality. It is often linked to the elixir of immortality, suggesting that drinking from the cup or using it in a certain ritualistic context could bestow eternal life or youth upon the user. This feature aligns the cup of Jamshid with the universal quest for immortality a common theme in many mythologies. The cup is not just a physical object, but a symbol of divine wisdom, authority, and the quest for eternal life. It represents the zenith of power and knowledge, illustrating the idea that the possessor of the cup has access to truths beyond the reach of ordinary mortals. The cup of Jamshid has left a significant imprint on Persian culture and literature often appearing in poems, stories, and artworks as a symbol of the transcendent and the mystical. It embodies the fusion of the earthly and the divine, the temporal and the eternal. What makes the cup of Jamshid particularly weird or peculiar is the juxtaposition of its simple form as a cup or chalice with its profound and almost limitless powers. The ability to grant both omniscience and immortality places it among the most potent and mysterious artifacts in mythology, transcending the common perception of what a vessel can do or be. The Tarnhelm, Norse Mythology The Tarnhelm was forged by the dwarf Andvari, a master craftsman whose skills in metalwork and enchantment were unparalleled. Dwarves in Norse mythology are often depicted as exceptional smiths and magicians, and the creation of the Tarnhelm is a testament to their abilities. The helmet's creation wasn't just an act of craftsmanship, but also a feat of magical engineering. 
imbuing it with properties that defy the natural order. One of the Tarnhelm's primary abilities is to render its wearer invisible. This power is not just a simple vanishing act. It's a profound alteration of perception, allowing the user to move unseen, evade capture, or escape danger. Perhaps even more remarkable is the Tarnhelm's ability to allow its wearer to transform into any form or creature. This shape-shifting ability isn't merely physical, but also enables the user to adopt the attributes and abilities of the chosen form, whether it's an animal, another person, or even inanimate objects. In the Volsunga Saga, the Tarnhelm is a crucial element in the tale of Sigurd, or Siegfried in the Germanic version, a legendary hero who slays the dragon Fafnir. The Tarnhelm comes into the possession of the dragon Fafnir. Fafnir uses the Tarnhelm's powers to transform himself into a dragon and guard his hoard of treasure. Sigurd, or Siegfried in the Wagnerian adaptation, a legendary hero, ultimately confronts Fafnir, who is still using the Tarnhelm to maintain his dragon form. After slaying Fafnir, Sigurd takes possession of the Tarnhelm and the rest of the treasure, including the cursed ring and Varanaut. Its powers are central to the plot's development, influencing the actions and fates of various characters. Wagner's adaptation of the Tarnhelm imbues it with a symbolic weight, representing the themes of power, deception, and transformation that permeate the operatic cycle. What makes the Tarnhelm particularly intriguing and peculiar is its profound impact on identity and reality. The ability to become invisible or to transform into any entity challenges the very notions of self and the nature of existence. It blurs the lines between being and seeming, reality and illusion, posing philosophical questions about the essence of identity and the limits of power. Moreover, the Tarnhelm's existence in Norse mythology reflects the ancients' fascination with and fear of the unknown and the uncontrollable. It symbolizes the potential and danger of unbridled power, the allure of escaping one's nature, and the existential dread of non-being or loss of self. The Bagua, Chinese mythology. The Bagua are traditionally attributed to the legendary emperor Fu Shi, a culture hero in Chinese mythology, who is said to have observed the patterns of the natural world, and inspired by these observations, created the eight trigrams. The story goes that Fu Shi saw the patterns on the back of a mythical dragon horse, sometimes a turtle, that emerged from the Luo River. He observed the flight patterns of birds, celestial patterns, and the natural landscape. These observations led him to conceptualize the Bagua as a representation of the fundamental principles of reality. Each trigram consists of three lines, each line being either broken, representing yin, or unbroken, representing yang. The eight trigrams are heaven, lake, fire, thunder, wind, water, mountain, earth. These trigrams are combined in pairs to form 64 hexagrams, which are used in the I Ching, Book of Changes, a foundational text for Chinese divination and philosophy. The Bagua are believed to encapsulate the fundamental principles of reality, embodying the dynamic interplay of yin and yang, the two opposing yet complementary forces that make up the universe. The Bagua, especially when expanded into the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching, serve as a tool for divination, offering guidance based on the principle that the universe is a coherent, interconnected system where every event has meaning and is interconnected. In Feng Shui, the Bagua map is used to analyze and optimize the energy flow within spaces, aligning human environments with the broader harmonies of the natural world. In some traditions of Chinese martial arts, the Bagua are associated with Bagua Zhang, a style that emphasizes movement around a circle and is directly inspired by the Bagua's principles. In this sense, the Bagua can be considered a divine gift in a broader, more metaphorical way. They are a gift of wisdom and knowledge from the universe itself, revealed through the natural world to Fu Shi, who then shared this gift with humanity by codifying these universal principles into the Bagua system. This process underscores the idea that wisdom and understanding are available in the natural world and cosmos, waiting to be discovered by those who are observant and attuned to the patterns and rhythms of the universe. 
the jewel, mirror, and sword, Japanese mythology. The jewel, mirror, and sword, known as the imperial regalia of Japan, are deeply significant symbols in Japanese mythology and are closely associated with the imperial lineage. These regalia are known as the three sacred treasures. The mirror, Yata no Kagami, represents wisdom or honesty, depending on the interpretation. It is said to reflect the truth and encourage introspection, acting as a divine symbol that embodies the virtue of wisdom. The mirror's mythological significance is tied to the sun goddess Amaterasu, one of the most prominent deities in Shinto religion. The story goes that Amaterasu, angered by the mischievous behavior of her brother, the storm god Suzanu, hid herself in the Amano Iwato, the heavenly rock cave, plunging the world into darkness. The other gods, eager to bring back the light, devised a plan to lure her out. They placed the Yata no Kagami outside the cave. When Amaterasu peeked out, she saw her reflection in the mirror and was so captivated by her own brightness that she came out of the cave, bringing light back to the world. The mirror was then enshrined as a sacred object. The jewel, Yasakani no Magatama, symbolizes benevolence or kindness. Magatama are curved, comma-shaped beads that have been used in Japan since ancient times as jewelry and religious symbols, believed to hold magical or spiritual significance. The sword, Kusanagi no Tsurugi, symbolizes valor and bravery. Its story is linked to Susanoo's encounter with a monstrous serpent, Yamata no Orochi. After defeating the beast, Susanoo discovered the sword in one of its tails. The sword was later presented to Amaterasu and became one of the three imperial regalia. It represents the courage and strength of the warrior and is a symbol of the emperor's duty to protect the nation. The Aegis, Greek mythology. The Aegis is often described as a shield or a breastplate, though its exact nature varies in different myths. It is sometimes depicted as being made of animal hide, particularly the hide of the divine goat Amalthea, who nursed Zeus when he was an infant. One of the Aegis's most distinctive features when associated with Athena is the Gorgon's head, usually Medusa's, fixed in its center. In some myths, the Aegis is wielded by Zeus himself, symbolizing his protection and might. It is sometimes described as thunderous, capable of creating storms and casting bolts of lightning, which aligns with Zeus's control over the sky and weather. More commonly, the Aegis is associated with Athena, who is often depicted wearing it or carrying it into battle. The story of how Athena came to possess the Aegis varies in different sources. In some accounts, the Aegis was made by the god Hephaestus and given to Athena by Zeus. In others, Athena is simply depicted as having the Aegis, without a detailed explanation of how she acquired it. The transfer of the Aegis from Zeus to Athena symbolizes her role as Zeus's daughter and one of the primary deities associated with warfare and protection in the Greek pantheon. The presence of Medusa's head on the Aegis she wields ties back to the story of Perseus, whom Athena aided in his quest to decapitate Medusa. The head on the Aegis not only serves as a symbol of divine power and terror, but also as a reminder of Athena's wisdom, strategic prowess, and her role in one of Greek mythology's most famous heroic endeavors. The Aegis represents the ultimate protection, not just in a physical sense, but also metaphysically, offering divine safeguarding against both mortal and supernatural threats. It signifies the favor of the gods, especially when carried by heroes or demigods in myths. When used in battle, the Aegis could instill fear and confusion among the enemy ranks, reflecting its aspect as a weapon of divine terror. Its mere presence could turn the tide of conflict, underscoring the intertwining of divine influence and mortal affairs in Greek mythology. In summary, the Aegis is not just a simple shield, it's a complex symbol of divine power, protection, and terror. Its transition from Zeus to Athena illustrates the fluid nature of divine attributes and responsibilities in Greek mythology, where objects of power can be shared or transferred among the gods according to their roles and domains. The Aegis's peculiar nature lies in its combination of defensive and offensive powers, embodying a divine tool that is as much about instilling fear as it is about offering protection. The Salmon of Knowledge, Celtic Mythology, 
The story originates from the Fenian cycle of Irish mythology. The salmon gained its knowledge by eating the hazelnuts that fell into the Well of Wisdom, Tobar Sagais, from the nine hazel trees that surrounded it. These trees were considered sources of wisdom, and their nuts were highly coveted. When the salmon consumed them, it absorbed all the world's knowledge. Phinegas, a wise poet and Fion's mentor, spent years trying to catch the salmon of knowledge, knowing its value. The prophecy had foretold that he would catch the salmon, but also that he was not the one to gain its wisdom. When Phinegas finally caught the salmon, he instructed his young pupil Fion to cook it for him, but not to eat any of it. While cooking the salmon, Fion burned his thumb on the hot fish and instinctively put his thumb in his mouth to soothe the pain. This simple act transferred the salmon's wisdom to him. From then on, whenever Fion needed insight or knowledge, he would suck his thumb and the needed wisdom would come to him. The story emphasizes that knowledge and wisdom can come from unexpected sources and are often gained inadvertently rather than through deliberate pursuit. The tale underscores a profound connection between knowledge and the natural world, a recurring theme in Celtic mythology, where trees, animals, and natural features often possess significant powers or insights. Despite Finnegas's efforts, the prophecy fulfilled itself, showing that some events are destined to occur regardless of human intervention. The Salmon of Knowledge has become an iconic element of Irish folklore, symbolizing the quest for knowledge and the belief that wisdom can be found in the natural world around us. It also illustrates the idea that wisdom can be gained through experience and interaction with the world, not just through formal education or deliberate study. If you found these tales as intriguing as we do, don't forget to hit that like button, share this video with your friends, and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating insights into the world of mythology and beyond. Your support helps us bring more of these captivating stories to light. Until next time, keep seeking knowledge and exploring the mysteries of the past.